everyone, and thank you to thank you for coming to my talk, Nourish Your New Nerves, my top five supplements and strategies for dealing with anxiety. I'm going to present to you a lot of the different alternative options that are available to you, and you can pick and choose the ones that re resonates the most and discard anything that does not fit for you, as one size uh, does not fit all. Is this you? Perhaps this is more like you. Some of you might be this person. And if it is, then you have come to the right place. So let's start with a definition of what anxiety is. So anxiety disorders are one of the most prevalent psychiatric conditions that modern human beings in the Western world are facing today. It includes phobias, panics, general anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorders, and social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Of these, general anxiety disorder, OCD, and PTSD are the most common. Women are twice as likely as men to have an anxiety disorder. I'll share an American statistic just because they have a higher population density, but Canadian statistics are quite similar. According to the National Institutes of Mental Health, 18.1% of U.S. adults have an anxiety disorder, and of these, 22.8% are classified as severe. And many people do not obviously um, report that they have an anxiety disorder if they are self-medicating. So these statistics don't include those who might turn to alcohol or drugs or other addictive substances or behaviors in order to cope with their anxiety. Globally, about four to six percent of the world is suffering from various forms of anxiety disorders. Some of these symptoms are high blood pressure, an elevated heart rate, sweating, fatigue, unpleasant feelings, tension, irritability, and restlessness. And if it goes untreated, 40 to 50% of these people will progress to having depression and suicidal thoughts. Depression and anxiety are usually co-occurring. Some symptoms of the general anxiety disorder also include excessive worrying about the little details of life, an increased startle reflex, fears of crowds, jumpiness, impaired concentration, ongoing incessant irrational thoughts, restless sleep or insomnia, muscle tension, irritability or edginess. Panic attacks are a more acute form of anxiety. They have a sudden onset, and they're very overwhelming to the point that it completely interferes with the individual's ability to function and perform routine daily tasks. The symptoms of a panic attack include palpitations, pounding or rapid heart rate, sweating, body temperature changes, trembling, shortness of breath, chest pain, and discomfort, nausea or digestive distress, dizziness, lightheadedness, and the fear of losing control or going crazy. Here's just a list. By the way, this entire presentation will be available to you if you guys want to come to NACA's booth 101, uh, so, uh, Nature Source booth, I will be there and you can leave your information. So don't worry if you don't take all the notes. So here today we are treating anxiety not just as a purely psychological phenomenon, but one that's directly t uh, linked to the state of our physiology, because the mind affects the body, and then the body in turn affects the mind. So a holistic approach is far more integrated, and it looks at the entire psychophysiologic dynamics of the person, rather than taking a purely psychological approach. The typical Western allopathic approach includes cognitive behavioral therapy as well as drug interventions. Mostly benzodiazepines are what's prescribed, although some antidepressants as well. However, we have some challenges with this approach. First of all, it does not address the root cause of what the anxiety is, um, you know, being 
caused by. It's not addressing the root cause. Could be physical, could be your lifestyle, could be your environment, could be driving to work every day on the 401. The second reason is it's habit forming. Because it's habit forming, we can build up a tolerance. So over time, higher and higher doses might be required to feel the same effect or any effect at all. Number three is that there are some key withdrawal symptoms that we need to be concerned about. And number four is that whenever you choose to take a drug, you have to accept that there are known toxic side effects. So how did we get to this point where so many of us are experiencing anxiety to the point that it begins to interfere with our ability to function and carry out basic routine life tasks? The first most important cause is nutrient deficiencies in particular, mineral deficiencies. Modern agriculture, as you can see, this is what modern agriculture looks like today. Uh, we use a lot of chemicals, and in particular, we use phosphate fertilizers that miss out on a number of key minerals which are required by our bodies. In fact, phosphate fertilizers use only about three minerals. They miss, you know, a very broad spectrum of trace and essential minerals. So if your soil is dead, you're not going to have the plants and the vegetables growing in that soil to have a high amount of these key nutrients. Also, we do not practice crop rotation. We keep reusing the same soil again and again and again and again. Traditionally, you're supposed to let the, solo, um, the soil follow out, give it a rest, move to a different plot of land so that it can regenerate. But we don't do that today because in the quest for profit, uh, nutrition is less important than getting these products to market and losing nothing along the way. The next reason why anxiety is so prevalent, or we believe anxiety is so prevalent in the holistic community, is that there are blood sugar imbalances. Diabetes is on the rise, and it's a well-known fact that diabetics do suffer from mineral deficiencies. Also, if you have reactive hypoglycemia, which is the opposite, it's low blood sugar, you'd be surprised to know that many of the symptoms you consider anxiety symptoms are actually symptoms of reactive hypoglycemia. When your blood sugar rapidly drops due to mineral deficiencies, dehydration, too much caffeine and stress, your symptoms will include heart palpitations, sweating, and emotional volatility. So you can see how closely aligned simple low blood sugar is to what we call an anxiety attack. The next reason is we are living today in uh, one of the most stressful civilizations of our time. We are far more stress than our ancestors were. There's more and new complications that our ancestors did not deal with, and the pace of life is moving at a rapid speed. Hans Seeley um, is a person who defined what stress is in the turn of the century, and he said that 90% of all disease is related to stress. So stress can be a physical uh, situation where you have an injury, again, nutritional deficiencies, or you just have wear and tear on the body, exhaustion, or you could have emotional stress or stress that's the result of your lifestyle, where you live, who you work with, what your social interactions are with your friends or your family, or if you have limited social interactions, isolation is becoming uh, a very, uh, people are looking at isolation as a detrimental factor in our modern lifestyles, and they're saying it's almost as bad as smoking is for your health. So over time, stress will deplete the body's nutritional reserves because your metabolism is working faster, and also because it engages adrenaline, which will deplete your minerals and other key nutrients faster. The key neurotransmitters, which are the brain chemicals or key messengers in the body, in the brain, that are involved in anxiety are adrenaline and its relative noradrenaline, as well as GABA, which stands for GABA aminobutyric acid. We'll talk about that neurochemical more specifically today, as well as serotonin. The key hormone involved in anxiety syndromes is chronic release of cortisol. So, Speaking of nutritional deficiencies, let's begin with magnesium. The question that we're asking today is, anxiety a magnesium deficiency? According to Dr. Caroline Dean's book, The Magnesium Miracle, there are three key things you need to know about magnesium and anxiety. Number one, magnesium deficiency can produce symptoms of anxiety and depression, including muscle weakness, fatigue, eye twitches, insomnia, 
anorexia, ap apathy, apprehension, poor memory, confusion, anger, nervousness, and a rapid pulse. Serotonin, the feel-good brain chemical, which a lot of people take program, uh, Prozac 4 in order to boost, depends on magnesium for its production and its function. So if you have a lack of magnesium, you will also not have enough of the raw material to create serotonin, our feel-good, happy chemical. Number three is magnesium supports our adrenal glands, which become overworked by stress. The adrenal glands are two endocrine glands or hormone centers that sit on top of your kidneys, and they regulate cortisol in the body. Over time, th they become taxed if you're always in a state of stress, and they don't do their job as efficiently. When the adrenals are no longer protected by sufficient magnesium, it releases a fight or flight response from the body. Noradrenaline and adrenaline are dumped into the bloodstream, and they're also more easily triggered when you are magnesium deficient. So the more magnesium deficient you are, the more exaggerated is the adrenaline release. Magnesium will calm the nervous system and relax muscle tension, helping to reduce anxiety and panic attacks. So let's focus on the adrenals. Not only do our overworked adrenals cause magnesium depletion, but Carolyn Dean tells us that when you're releasing adrenaline, uh, sorry, but even more adrenaline is released when the magnesium is level, levels are low in the body. So you will feel irritable, you'll feel nervous, you'll feel edgy, or even ready to explode. So magnesium is low, Adrenaline's being released, adrenaline further depletes magnesium, which causes the body to freak out even more, and it's a vicious cycle. Interestingly, the symptoms of chronic magnesium deficiency mirror those of anxiety. And again, this has to do with how many biological processes rely on magnesium. There's over, it's estimated between 300 to 800 enzyme reactions in the body reply, uh, require magnesium. So if you're deficient, a whole bunch of systems could be out of whack. Symptoms of chronic magnesium deficiency include anxious behavior, hyper-emotionality, apathy, apprehension, a poor memory, confusion, anger, nervousness, muscle weakness, fatigue, headaches, insomnia, lightheadedness, dizziness, nervous fits, the feeling of having a lump in your throat, impaired breathing, muscle cramps, including leg cramps, a tingling or pricking or creeping feeling on the skin, rapid pulse, chest pain, palpitations, and an abnormal heart rhythm. Sounds like anxiety, but it could be that you need more magnesium. And we have seen many people start to take magnesium and be surprised to see that a lot of these symptoms subside. Magnesium is also very concentrated in the heart muscle. It's one of the largest muscles of the body, and it requires a lot of magnesium to function. So let's get more specifically into the stress response and magnesium deficiency. According to Dr. Carolyn Dean, anxiety is a chemical reaction created when the adrenal glands respond to a stressful event, such as low blood sugar, by releasing adrenaline. So again, the stressful event could be work issues, problems at home, financial stress, the kids are screaming at you, you have a health crisis, Low blood sugar is very stressful for the body. It always relates to a release of adrenaline. Or just driving in highway traffic is a very stressful event for a lot of commuters. Stress causes magnesium deficiency and it also depletes other key nutrients including the B vitamin complex and vitamin C. And a lack of magnesium in these key nutrients magnifies your experience of stress. So the magnification of stress occurs as a result of lacking these key nutrients we require to boost the neurochemistry, the serotonin, the happy chemicals, which act as a buffer to the psychological and physical stressors. We need these nutrients to be resilient in the face of stress. So stress can be broken down into this, this little flow chart. 
You begin with stress, and it's often a metaphor for fear. You could be fearful of something consciously or subconsciously. That leads to the fight or flight response of the body, which is a hormone dump. That's the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, cortisol when it's long term, and your body goes into survival mode. As a result of those chemicals in the body, adrenaline, noradrenaline, there is a nutrient depletion. They're rapidly using up the magnesium, the B complex, the vitamin C, and so forth. And then that lack of sufficient nutrients makes your body more stressed and leads to further adrenaline release and fight or flight response. So it is a vicious cycle. And as you deplete these healthy nutrients, you're less able to. Uh, you don't have the the raw materials to create the neurotransmitters you need to feel good. So, out of all the magnesiums that you can choose, there's a particular one that you want to look at if you have anxiety or any of the other anxiety-related conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. There is a novel compound that was found.、Um, it was a group of MIT scientists working on finding drugs for neurodegenerative diseases when they sort of accidentally discovered the unique compound called magnesium L-threonate. So essentially, for absorption and bioavailability of magnesium in the body, it needs to be bound to something. It could be bound to oxide or citrate or orotate. But when it's bound to L-threonate. It has the unique ability to cross through the blood-brain barrier and concentrate in the brain and the spinal fluid, with some interesting positive benefits to the user. They have done clinical human trials that have showed that magtine—that's the patented name for magnesium L3 and A. Can help people with depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. It's relaxing the emotional centers of the brain, the hippocampus and the amygdala.、Um, But they're still investigating further as to how it works and through what mechanisms. So, out of all your magnesiums, and you should take a variety, magtine is the only magnesium which will effectively increase brain magnesium levels. It's also been clinically proven to increase brain synaptic density, so it's very good for memory as well. Magtine is the patent. The mineral magnesium is bound to L-threonine,、uh, L-theanine. L3 and 8, sorry, L3 and 8. So yes. All right, we can we can do a lot of、um, questions as well as at the booth. Keep that in mind. So clinically proven to alleviate anxiety and clinically proven to help the stress that is the root cause of anxiety, among many other things. Several studies were done. I'll just focus on one of these. It was interesting. It was examining cr examining chronic. Dietary magnesium L3 nate intake on the extinction of what is called condition tasted version. Essentially, here's what happened: they had a group of mice. They exposed the mice to sucralose, which is a chemical sweetener. Instinctively, the mice developed an aversion to it. They now learned, okay, I don't want to go near sucralose. So every time they would put out the sucralose, the the mice did not respond by going towards it. They were repulsed by it. They were then exposed to magnesium L3 and 8, and after that exposure, they were reintroduced to the sucralose, which they developed previously an aversion to, and now it was no problem. So what that Suggests is that if you have a trauma or a fearful experience, or you find that your anxiety is always triggered in a certain ex- in a certain situation, because there are some anxieties that are purely situational. One person might be totally anxious public speaking, but then be perfectly fine talking one on one to someone. So it was a very interesting study. There's a lot of conclusions you can draw from it, but it seems to say that it is. Relaxing the area of the brain that stores those fearful memories and reactions, and sort of causing them to go extinct. So, if you, that study is available, you can draw your own conclusions and look deeper if you like. In general, the recommended daily allowance for women is 360 milligrams,、um, but don't stop there because that's just the daily allowance, and a lot of times we want to have an optimal level. About 600 to 800 milligrams for optimal levels of magnesium bisglycinate form. If you're taking L3 and 8, 144 milligrams is what's in the capsule, 
and that's the exact dosage that was used in all the studies. Because it has such an affinity for the brain, it's, it's basically only going to the brain, it's targeted, it's tissue specific, so you don't really need to take as much. Stress, anxiety, and adaptogen herbs. One of the things you might want to explore in helping you to cope better with your anxiety would be a group of herbs called adaptogens. An adaptogen is a herb that does exactly what it sounds like it does. It helps the body adapt to stressful conditions. The condition could be mental, emotional, or physical. There's a wide range to choose from. You have Siberian ginseng, rhodiola, ashwagandha, schizandra berry, holy basil, and maca exhibits some of the properties of an adaptogen. It's also known as Peruvian ginseng. Today we're going to focus a little bit more on one of these adaptogens called ashwagandha. I like this little photo. This woman is saying, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm fine, my legs hurt, leave me alone, come here. I want pancakes, cardio, I'm bloated, peanut butter, love me. If this is you, you might want to explore ashwagandha. So, out of all of the ashwagandhas that you can choose from, and ashwagandha, let's just give a brief overview. It's an Ayurvedic herb, which comes from ancient India. It has over 5,000 years of clinical history on it, unbroken. The medical science of Ayurveda is a 5,000-year-old system that's an unbroken system of medicine. And so it's been used for a very long time. Nowadays, modern science has caught up to it, and it is affirming what the ancients seem to always have known. The key active ingredient in ashwagandha that helps you to react to stress and deal with your anxiety is called withanolides. There's a novel compound called sensoril, that's the patented name of a specific ashwagandha, where they've taken that key ingredient and they've concentrated it so there's a higher percentage of withanolides in this type of ashwagandha versus other generic ashwagandhas. But the others are fine too. You can take a powder, a tablet, you can take it in a tincture, but if you really want faster results, you might look at sensoril. There's an interesting human study. By the way, there's over eight clinical human studies on this particular ashwagandha alone. And one of those studies showed there was a 69.9% reduction in an overall measure of stress-related symptoms that included irritability, anxiety, sleeplessness, sweating, headaches, muscle pain, and heart palpitations. So nearly 70% of those subjects in this particular study who took Sensorel saw a reduction in their stressful symptoms. So that's very interesting. It's also multi-patented. There's not just one patent on it. Um, in this same study, this is very cool, it showed that sensorial exposure in anxious, stressed individuals who are also having sleep issues saw a serum cortisol level drop by 24.2%. So remember, cortisol is your chronic stress hormone. And these individuals had a lowering of cortisol by 24.2%. That is very statistically significant. So, um, with respect to ashwagandhas, if you're exploring, look for powder tincture or capsule. Explore all the various ones I listed. Again, you can have a copy of this. Um, but really, ashwagandha is probably the top recommended adaptogen herb right now because it is so well studied and it does so many wonderful things. All right, so we talked about how when you're releasing adrenaline and you're under stress and you're feeling anxious, a lot of nutrients are rapidly used up. And one of those groups of, B vitamin, uh, one of, those groups of vitamins or nutrients is the B-complex family of vitamins. Um, so we do know that the B-complex is often low in people with anxiety and depression. These are water-soluble vitamins. We don't store them in the body. We need to intake them on a daily, regular basis. And if your food is not supplying them in vast quantities, and on top of that you're under stress, then you're just simply not having enough in circulation, and it will affect your mood and how you feel. The key B vitamins that seem to be the most efficient in somebody with anxiety, stress, and depression are B6, B12, and folic acid. Look for a high-potency B-complex supplement. 
also look for the coenzyme form of the B complex. It will usually say that on the label. The coenzyme form are the bioactive form of those vitamins. Essentially, your body does not have to convert them to their active form, so they're more usable. They are virtually used right away by the body. It's the most easily recognized way to deliver them. Vitamin B6, take 50 to more towards 100 milligrams a day. B12, consider taking 1,000 micrograms daily. Again, use the coenzyme form. That's the methylcobalamin, not cobalamin. And then take folic acid, 1 to 2 milligrams per day. These key nutrients are crucial for neurotransmitter synthesis, for creating serotonin and GABA. Again, we're going to go more deeply into what GABA is. Uh, one of the B vitamins is called inositol. You find it in a B complex. And there's some interesting evidence suggesting that inositol uh, supplementation alone can be helpful and effective for people with obsessive compulsive disorder, which is where there's a compulsion to perform routine tasks in order to feel calm and at ease with yourself. Also, keep in mind that vitamin B6 works very closely with magnesium in its goal to boost serotonin. So there's a synergy. A lot of vitamins and minerals work together. Also, women who have PMS are especially prone to being deficient in vitamin B6. So if you know you have those hormonal imbalances, you also want to take B6, because there could be a link to um, your anxiety if it's around the time of the month. So to review, anxiety involves serotonin, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and GABA as the neurotransmitters, um, and then the hormone cortisol. To understand anxiety, we also need to understand the sleep epidemic of our culture. Uh, stress, anxiety, and sleep disturbance are often linked. Those who have anxiety often have a sleep disturbance, and those who have sleep issues often have anxiety. According to market data research, the prescription sleep aid market in the U.S. alone, and again, Canadian statistics are similar, was estimated to be worth $28.6 billion in 2017. So this gives you an idea of just how widespread sleep issues and insomnia are. So a sleep issue could be trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, or having interrupted sleep throughout the night. So it gives you an idea of the scope of the problem. According to the National Institutes of Health, more than 70 million people in the U.S. alone are affected by sleep disorders and circadian rhythm imbalances. The National Institutes of Health is one of the world's largest health research centers. It studies Canadian populations as well as American populations and gives grants all over the world. So their data is pretty significant. So what can we do? You can look for some really good sleep aid formulas that will help to get your body's circadian rhythm back on track. And interestingly, a lot of them can be found in a formula, and if you take them individually, a lot of them work for anxiety just on their own. So these, this list that I'm going to go through is good for sleep, but it's all, each of them are also well studied for anxiety. And it can get you on track. So I'll go through the list real quick and we'll go into specifics. The first nutrient is L-theanine. Consider taking 100 milligrams daily. The second nutrient in a formula you might find is GABA, at least 25 milligrams. When you take formulas, you tend to get good therapeutic doses, but lower doses of each individual nutrient compared to if you take a little bit extra separately or just on its own. Then you have L5-HTP, which we'll talk about, 50 milligrams. Valerian, 100 milligrams. Passion flower, 75 milligrams, hops, 50 milligrams, and melatonin, 3 milligrams. Plus magnesium, it's great if there's magnesium in the formula as well, but for sure take it separate and in high doses. So first let's talk about L-theanine. L-theanine comes from green tea. It is a nutrient that is associated with boosting GABA production, and GABA is that neurotransmitter that gives us a sense of calm and ease. It gives us mental clarity and it calms down the mental chatter in our brains. If your brain is always talking to you and never stopping, you might have low levels of GABA. It's also associated with producing an alpha state in the brain. So a lot of monks will drink green tea because it produces that calm alpha state, but it also allows them to focus because there's the caffeine. 
if you are someone who finds their anxiety is worse by drinking caffeine, then try switching from coffee to green tea, or if green tea is still too, too much, too much of the jitters from green tea, cut out green tea altogether and get away from caffeine and just take L-theanine by itself. And you can take as much as 200 to 400 milligrams, one to two, one to two times per day. Next, GABA, which again, L-theanine can help boost and other herbs can help to boost. GABA helps um, because it's been linked, low levels have been linked to anxiety, depression, and insomnia. And again, it gives you a relaxed feeling, greater mental focus and alertness. It's associated with the alpha state and it reduces the beta waves in our brain that are associated with nervousness and hyperactivity. Next, we have L5-HTP. L5-HTP is the precursor to serotonin. So first, you usually begin with the amino acid tryptophan. Our body will convert that into L5-HTP, and then our body will convert that into serotonin, which is our happy, feel-good chemical. Then you need serotonin to produce melatonin. So this is why stress and depression are usually linked to sleep issues. If you have low serotonin, you could be depressed, and then if you have low serotonin, you're not producing the sleep chemical melatonin in adequate levels. So everything is connected, which is why a holistic approach can be so beneficial. So if you supplement directly with L5-HTP, it can help increase serotonin synthesis, it can help address the serotonin balances linked to depression and anxiety, can promote a feeling of well-being and help you to sleep and get your circadian rhythm back on track. In a sleep formula, you're often going to find valerian. It's a sedative herb without the side effects of sedative drugs. You can take 100 milligrams a day, one time per day. And it's interesting, the drug Valium actually is derived from valerian. But valerian, because it's the whole compound, does not have those same side effects. But it is a sedative herb. Then we have passion flower. It's known as the calming herb. It's one of the most top recommended herbs for anxiety. Even if you just take passion flower alone, you, most of you will feel really good, have a sense of calm and ease where before you had a feeling of overwhelm. You can take it in a tincture, you can take it in a tablet, you can get the dried flower herb and put it into a tea and steep that. There's many ways that you can consider um, taking it. But what's really cool is that recent studies have found passion flower to be comparable to benzodiazepine drugs, the trade name for one of them being Ativan. So they've studied it in the treatment of anxiety and insomnia, and they saw similar effects were happening as what happened with uh, the drug Ativan and benzodiazepines. So again, melatonin helps to maintain the body's circadian rhythm. If you work a night shift, you could have sleep issues, um, hormonal imbalances. A lot of times menopausal women will have night sweats keeping them up at night or insomnia as one of the symptoms of a rocky road through menopause and the change of life. Um, also, again, if you have low serotonin, your circadian rhythm could be off. If you don't have blackout curtains in your bedroom and there's a lot of light coming in, or you have children sleeping on the bed or animals sleeping on the bed, that could disrupt your sleep. So you want to make sure that you, you use the blackout curtains, you have it quiet, and this will help to simulate nighttime. If you always have a light on or light coming through the windows, then that will tell your body it's daytime because the body's biological rhythm when it's in sync is completely synced up with the cycles of nature. The sun comes up, we start to wake up, cortisol should start to rise, just you know, healthy levels, we're alert in the day, and then that declines and we should have melatonin production happening when we're no longer having light hit the retina. Another great area to consider in your quest for anxiety relief naturally are essential oils, which have been well studied for their anxiolytic effects. So it's one of the last recommendations I want to touch on today. It's aromatherapy. It's really popular right now. Um, a lot of attention on aromatherapy. It's the world's most commonly used complementary and alternative medicine. So it goes way, way back to ancient times, to the times of the pharaohs. There's a lot of clinical human studies that has been done on it. And there's a great review that was done of 16 human studies 
All of them were assessed and found that the use of aromatherapy exhibited a positive effect on the patients who had anxiety without the side effects of drugs. So only 16 clinical human studies were assessed. There's actually more than 16 human studies that have been done on essential oils and anxiety. There's different theories for this as to how this works, but some research has shown that certain essential oils like lavender work similarly to diazepam, which activates GABA. So it activates that neurotransmitter that calms us, makes us feel at ease, and gives us a sense of peace. Um, other research has shown that some uh, oral lavender oil actually has been as effective as lorazepam. So they're, they're often comparing it to traditional drugs. Another theory of why aromatherapy helps is that it stimulates our emotional memory. Certain scents are associated with certain pleasant memories in our mind. So it acts on the oil factory glands of the brain, which boosts serotonin and dopamine and feel-good chemicals um, when it reminds us of a really good experience that we had in the past. So there's the emotional memory that's stimulated. It's probably a combination of GABA release, emotional memory, and stimulating the oil factory glands and telling the body to produce serotonin and other feel-good chemicals. An example, that, um, an example study is that they exposed patients to a situation of the dentist office. A lot of people go to the dentist's office and they experience anxiety. They just, just the smell of the dentist's office produces an anxious response. So this is an example of state anxiety. It's a specific situation eliciting an anxious response. And they exposed these individuals to lavender essential oil and saw a dramatic decrease in their anxiety symptoms. There are many essential oils that you might want to try. Uh, the key ones that assist the nervous system and kind of tighten it up and tone it up and help calm and relax you include lavender, probably the most studied. You could use the essential oil. Some people put a sprig of lavender underneath their bed. You can make lavender tea. But if you have a diffuser, putting a couple of drops in your diffuser before bed can give you the best sleep you've ever had in your life and just give you such, such a sense of peace. Also, the citrus studies, which have been very well studied, the lemongrass, lemon, orange, and tangerine, very uplifting and mood-boosting, stimulating the areas of the brain that, that boost a feeling of well-being and good vibes. Then you have rosemary. It's a nervine tonic and a brain booster. It tightens up and tones the nervous system, um, and it also releases a lot of stress might have had a massage therapy session where some of these oils were used and you just felt extra good compared to when you, you don't have the aromatherapy. It's a big difference. Some other oils that promote well-being, stress relief, anxiety relief, include eucalyptus, peppermint, and one of my favorites is vetiver. It has a very grounding effect. Vetiver, it kind of smells like soil, so it's not for everybody, but it's just grounding and it just calms you right down. So just to give you insight into how powerful aromatherapy can be is a group of cocaine, crack cocaine addicts uh, were, were put into a study and they were going to measure their anxiety symptoms before and after exposure to citrus orantium essential oil, which is a species of orange oil. And the crack cocaine addicts who did receive, through nebulization, which is like kind of like a gas mask, received the essential oil, had a huge reduction in their anxiety experience compared to the group that was not exposed to the essential oil. So this was just direct administration through nebulization, kind of like a gas mask, and they took a group of people experiencing very significant withdrawal. So that just gives you an idea of the potency of what essential oil can offer without being very invasive at all. You're not eating these things. Um, you know, many times it's just on the skin or through inhalation. Beautiful lavender field there. 
In Germany, there's a standardized essential oil extract of lavender that has been approved for oral administration in the use of subsyndromal anxiety. So in, in Europe, it's actually been approved as a go-to anti-anxiety um, drug. If it's been legally approved, they're probably classified as a drug, although it's you know a natural substance. One study showed that um, the lavender was just as good as the drug Ipramine, but without the side effects. So just as effective as another benzodiazepine called Ipramine, without withdrawal, without tolerance, without side effects. So the advantages of exploring essential oils for anxiety are that you get the calming effect without sedation. There's a lack of dependence, tolerance, or withdrawal. You'll not build a tolerance up to it. The rapid onset, as soon as you put that essential oil in the diffuser or in a carrier oil on your temples, that soothing effect is immediate. And it's safe, effective, and non-invasive. So there's no hard and fast rules. You can experiment with you know, how you want to apply these things, but you could use a couple of drops in a diffuser. Even if you use 10 drops in a diffuser, that's not a problem. It will just be stronger. So decide what fits for you. Um, you there's a wide range of applications. Therapeutic massage, nebulization is not as commonly used because that's usually administered by a medical doctor. Um, you could put it in a humidifier. You could put it lavender on a little tissue near your pillow. You could put it in the carrier oil as part of one of your skin care regimens. You can put it in direct application in a roll-on on your temples. You can make bath bombs. Um, you can put a few drops in your bath. But here's what you want to look for. You want to look for solvent-free. You don't want any harsh chemical solvents being used in the extraction of the oil because that will end up in the finished product, and we know fats retain toxins. You want it to be steam distilled, GMO-free, 100% pure and undiluted. But again, no hard and fast rules. So experiment with what works for you. The next thing that our holistic approach for anxiety would need if it was to be complete is addressing and dealing with our emotions um, as they arise. We're often a culture that suppresses our emotions or we deal with our emotions through addictions, alcohol, distractions, work, workaholism. And if you don't deal with your emotions, there is evidence that they can become trapped in the body. We're here at the Whole Life Expo, so there's a lot of people talking about energy medicine. Um, it is a fact that you do have an energetic body. We know this from traditional Chinese medicine. They used to believe that the meridian channels of the body didn't exist, and now scientific instrumentation has proof that these channels of energy do exist. So oftentimes our trapped emotions, they end up blocking the meridians, and we experience that as distress when we're triggered by the same situation. And that's the situational anxiety. So look at what areas of your emotions you might need to deal with so that you can deal with your anxiety properly. Sir William Osler, um, an eminent doctor at the turn of the century, when he was treating tuberculosis, he said that the course of tuberculosis depends more on what the patient has in his head than what he has in his chest. So he was talking all this way back um, about the mind-body connection. What's going on with your head and what's being communicated to your heart? Today, we have a field dedicated to this called psychoneuroimmunology. Psyche is the mind, neuro is the nervous system, immunology, immune system, the study of. So we do understand that these three seemingly disparate um, categories are actually really related, or subjects. So the psychology, the state of your mind, impacts upon the nervous system experienced as your emotions or nervous system or tension or worry, and that impacts your immune system. Everyone knows when you're under stress, you could be more prone to coughs, colds, fevers, flus, and if you're overwhelmed, you could find that you get a cold, you get sick, you get run down. Um, so it's no longer debated that there are these psychosocial stressors. 
Uh, Dr. Paul J. Roche, medical doctor and president of the American Institute of Stress, said that more important than stressors like smoking or air pollution, asbestos, radiation hazards, or other concerns, were the psychosocial stressors, uh, which were around long before these modern problems. So a lot of people consider things like anxiety, cancer, depression, diseases of civilization. There's a lot of debate about if we had as much of what we have today way back when we didn't have these psychosocial uh, stressors. It's actually really important to look at your environment and your social networks because there was a recent German study that came out and said that social isolation is as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It has a really negative impact. Our ancestors were in tighter knit communities. There was more of a feeling of bonding. We're in a very individualistic culture. And sometimes that weighs on us psychologically and emotionally in ways we don't immediately recognize. So don't you know, suppress it immediately. Try to fix it first. So when we turn to a drug to suppress the way we feel, we actually don't resolve the emotion. It actually gets driven deeper and deeper into the body each time. These emotions become trapped within the physiology, and they're accessed every time we feel triggered. You go into that same situation, and it's like it's building. Now you're more anxious than the first time you were exposed to that same trigger. Or you have a person in your life who triggers you, and every time something happens with this person, you feel anxious. Um, social anxiety is like that. So when we don't deal with that, it goes deeper in the body. We know that from homeopathy. Homeopathy is the opposite of what we do with Western medicine. Instead of driving the problem deeper in the body, when you start taking homeopathic medicine, it sort of brings your issue to the surface that you thought was gone but had just been driven deeper. So again, over time, trapped emotions, although you don't physically see them, do set the stage for illness and disease mentally and physically. So what can you do to start to work with that? You'll, you can learn a lot of different modalities here at the Whole Life Expo. I'm sure there's some people talking about emotional freedom technique. That has helped me. I still use it every day. I have far less anxiety today than I ever have, but it's a go-to tool that once you learn it, you can use it every single day. We'll talk a little bit more about it um, on the next slide. You could do deep tissue work or rolfing. A lot of people have had the experience of deep tissue work and they don't know why they're crying, um, but that's the release of stored memory at the cellular level. So do body therapies, do massage, do deep tissue work. Yoga and meditation can get that energy moving. His emotion is just energy at the end of the day. Um, dancing, movement therapy, maybe Feldenkrais method, and journaling. Here's how emotional freedom technique works. It's actually also called thought field therapy, the tapping techniques. It was invented by a psychiatrist, Dr. Roger Callahan. He discovered that emotions become trapped in these acupuncture meridian channels of the body, and simply by tapping in certain areas, in certain sequences, you can expel that trapped energy. Acupuncture does the opposite. When you put the needle in, it's adding energy or prana or chi into the system. So what happened to him is he was a successful psychiatrist in California, and he realized that his patients kept coming to see him again and again and again. They weren't really getting better, that he was talking about the same issues for years, and he was very well paid because of it. So he started taking um, acupuncture courses and going to China and studying traditional Chinese medicine, which is where he learned about these meridian channels. And sort of as an experiment, he started to see that the emotions were trapped in specific areas of the body. So he had one particular phobic patient who had a fear of water. And he had gotten her to a point where she could sit relatively close to the pool that was in his backyard, you know, sort of in the kitchen area, and look at the water. And that was progress for her. But it couldn't be more than that. When he asked her, tell me how you feel when you look at the water, she grabbed her stomach. So this gave a clue to Dr. Callahan that there was maybe the trapped emotion was in her gut. He asked her to tap on the stomach meridian, and after just a short period of time, she was able to go up to the pool of water and experience no more fear, and her phobia, she said, was completely gone. So check it out. Um, there are studies underway with this. 
really cool, interesting research. It may or may not be for you, but if you learn it, it might be a way that you could cope or deal with your emotions naturally. And there's a great book on it as well. It's called Tapping the Healer Within, Using Thought Field Therapy to Instantly Conquer Your Fears, Anxieties, and Emotional Distress. And a lot of people are using it as the go-to tool. So again, I touched on uh, you want to look at your social networks and how social isolation and loneliness is a risk factor for early death and mortality. There was a really interesting uh, study that was done in psychological science and published in that journal in 2015. So Paramasana Yogananda said that your environment is stronger than your willpower. If you're in an unhealthy environment, if you don't feel supported, Believe it or not, that will impact upon your mental and your emotional well-being. It is harder when you have this, the form of anxiety called social anxiety to bridge that gap, but the best advice that I can give is to challenge yourself. You'll feel uncomfortable at first, but getting out there and joining a club or taking a dance class, being out with people, eventually you'll condition yourself and it won't be as overwhelming. So don't let it stop you. I like this quote as well. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So there's not something wrong with you. Oftentimes the environment needs to be healed. If your job is killing you, you might need to look at other options. Changing your environment. But the most empowering thing you could know is you could change your environment first with your minds and your emotion. Because your cells are bathing every single day in the environment of your thoughts and in the environment of your emotions. So just a quick list, again, this is available to you guys if you give me your email. Um, there's so many other things that you can look at that calm the body down. You can look at greens formulas, you can look at well-studied nervine tonic herbs like skull cap, make a nice skull cap tea maybe before bed. I really personally like vervain blue. It's known to tighten and tone up the nervous system if you're experiencing nervous exhaustion, your just nerves are shot. Um, you can have rosemary as essential oil, as mentioned, or you could put it in a tea, nice little tea bag, put it in, um, you know, put it in a little tea bag or steep it. You could do the anxiolytic herbs or anti-anxiety herbs, lemon balm, also called Melissa, passion flower as mentioned. Look at adrenal support, maybe work with a naturopath or a nutritionist on getting your adrenals back to where they need to be to be healthy. Maybe you endured a trauma, a death in the family, and you just never recovered from that. Your adrenals could need a little bit of love. You might look at licorice root. You might look at different adrenal formulas. Look at uh, hormone support. If your anxiety issues tend to be worse premenstrually, you might look at the herb Vitex. That for me was a contributing factor. My progesterone was low comparative to my estrogen, and I started taking Vitex to get the progesterone back up. You could do different types of detoxes. It could be chemicals in your environment, chemicals you're inhaling every day. Um, look for mold, black mold issues. You know, there's so many exposures to toxins that we have that do directly impact upon the brain and the nervous system. So doing a good detox is always worthwhile. Probiotics because of the brain-bowel connection. If you go to my website, which is contained in here, you'll see last year's talk, which was all about the brain-body connection. If you have mold, yeast, parasites, fungi, they're producing mycotoxins that get into the blood and pass through the blood-brain barrier, making you feel nervous and anxious, but there's a whole talk just on that. You might look at the back flower remedies. I've seen people go through trauma and say that rescue remedy is their go-to remedy. They just have to have it on them at all times. And then you can take all of these neurotransmitter precursors or the neurotransmitter uh, itself, GABA, L5-HTP precursor, L-theanine, SAMI, L-tryptophan, D-L-phenylalanine is the neuro transmitter you produce when you're in love, so it's a really good feel-good feel um, neurotransmitter that you can directly supplement with. And then lithium orotate is only available in the States, but a lot of people have explored that option and benefited from it as well. So just to recap, there's a lot of ways that you can integrate a holistic approach, choose the different things you want to add in that suit you the best. You don't have to feel overwhelmed. 
You could work with your practitioner to do it in a way that works for you. But overall, you want to reduce stress because of the, the huge impact of adrenaline and cortisol and anxiety and your ability to sleep. And then the long-term consequences of that being depression and potentially suicidal thoughts. You want to increase your hydration. That will help with blood sugar regulation. In particular, it really benefits people with reactive hypoglycemia. A lot of times they're dehydrated and overstimulated. I know from experience, I've had that before. So balance your blood sugar. Um, if you feel hangry and then you eat something and don't feel anxious, you know you need to balance your blood sugar. It's usually easier if a loved one tells you if you're hangry. It's hard enough, it's hard to admit it yourself. You can detoxify, you can clean up your diet of you know, things like aspartame, refined sugar, excitotoxins. Reduce or eliminate caffeine. First try switching to green tea. Um, a lot of people say just by getting off of coffee, their anxiety goes away. And finally, look at the medications you're taking uh, because drugs also lead to nutrient depletion. A little quote from The Magnesium Miracle by Dr. Dean. She said that we're a nation suffering a 32% incidence of anxiety, depression, and drug problems. So we're a very affluent society, but there's a lot of mental health issues happening right now. Dress the whole person. And I love this quote by Bruce Lipton. He's uh, one of the foremost authorities and researchers who was a cellular biologist, and he researched extensively the body-mind connection. So check out his work if you can. He talks about the power of what your thoughts are and your emotional states and how that impacts upon your body. So he says, the brain is the chemist. Change the picture, and you change the chemistry. Change what you communicate to yourself. Change what you visualize and, and picture to yourself about yourself and about your environment and your possibilities and your opportunities. And you can change the physiology. It will have a direct relationship. You can feel better naturally. And thank you, everyone, for joining me. The presentation was brought to you by NACA Herbs and Vitamins, and I'll be over at booth 101 for a meet and greet to answer your questions and, um, yeah, answer anything that came up during this talk. Thank you.